to proceed, dear brothers and sisters, in our current technological and political environment, attacks on science and knowledge continue to rise. Objective truths are no longer accepted as such, and facts are no longer indisputable. The phenomenon of the death of expertise appears to have taken grip throughout the internet, social media, television, and literature. The harms of speaking without knowledge are always proportionate to the influence of the speaker and also proportionate to the significance of the subject spoken about. And so, for example, if a vaccine is spoken against without knowledge, the harms extend beyond just the pharmaceutical company, but the entire population, in fact. This is just an example. And what then do you think the harms would be when the subject spoken about without knowledge affects not only people's lives, but also affects their afterlife? Allah Ta'ala surrounded his religion with a number of protective barriers to safeguard it from addition and omission. The aforementioned are transgressions. They are crimes against the Sharia, ah, against Allah and his messenger, as none has the right to ascribe to Allah or to his messenger any words which they did not reveal or speak of respectively. It is for this reason that Allah Ta'ala and his messenger forbade people and warned them from speaking in the matters of the religion without knowledge or put succinctly as we will speak about today giving fatwa without knowledge. What is fatwa? Linguistically brothers and sisters fatwa is revealing information on a matter previously concealed from most. The knowledge may be a uh, Reserve, maybe the knowledge may be the reserve of the questioned. As Allah Ta'ala, He said, They ask you for a ruling. Say, Allah gives you a ruling concerning the person who has, uh, who has non-linear heirs. Meaning this knowledge is something previously known only to Allah, then revealed to His Messenger, then to the rest of us. And as Allah Ta'ala tells us, when the former inmate asked Yusuf for the interpretation of the dream, he said, Yusuf, ayyuha siddiqu aftina. Yusuf, O oh believer or oh, unwavering believer, elucidate for us, reveal for us. And fatwa is revelation also of an opinion sought from a person of sound judgment and wisdom. As Bilqis, the queen of Sabah of Sheba asked her counsel for consultation and she said, قالت, amri. She said, O oh, chiefs, give me opinion in this matter of mine. Now, fatwa has then been used as a, was then used as a legal term describing a formal ruling or interpretation on a point of law given by a qualified legal scholar, also known as a mufti. Hence the mufti, dear brothers and sisters, was described as a signatory on Allah's behalf, as he permits and prohibits in Allah Ta'ala's name. And also, Muhammad ibn al-Munkadir, he said the mufti stands between Allah and the creation. So warning the mufti, he, he said, so know how you stand. Such a position is incredibly dangerous as the person exposes himself to frightening punishments in the case that he delivers erroneous religious decrees due to insufficient knowledge. Most of the companions knew the significance of fatwa, dear brothers and sisters, and they fled, they ran away from it. Abdul Rahman ibn Abi Layla, he said, I witnessed 120 of the companions from the Ansar, each of which, when they were asked a question, they would defer it to their brother, and the brother would defer it to the next, until the question would circle and return to the first person asked. 
Notice, these were the companions who witnessed revelation come down upon the Prophet ﷺ. The interpretation of the revelation. Who saw the Rasul ﷺ's actions and approvals and heard his speech. But yet, they used to push the question onto others. While today, people jostle for position and push and push to get to the front in order to be the first to answer the question. They wished, the companions wished, that somebody else would bear this burden because they realized the risks involved in assuming the position of iftar. And it wasn't just the companions. Al-Haytham ibn Jamil, he said, I witnessed Malik, Anas ibn Malik, sorry, I witnessed Malik, Malik ibn Anas, the, the grand imam, being asked in this mosque, the Prophet Sallallahu mosque, 48 questions, 32 of which he answered, I do not know. Many of us know this story, by the way. But notice here that Imam Malik, he could have observed humility by admitting he doesn't know the answer in private. But to do so in public, and not just on one issue, on one question, but 32 issues in front of his companions. Why? Because they knew the significance of fatwa. One man once asked him, Oh Imam, he asked him a question and Imam Malik, he said to him, I don't know, la adri. And he answered, it's a light matter, khafifa, it's something, it's a small matter. Imam Malik was angered and he said, khafifa, khafifa, light, light, you consider it small. There is nothing in knowledge that is small. Did you not hear Allah's words? Inna sanulqi alayka qawlan thaqila. Indeed. We are about to cast upon you, O Muhammad, a heavy word. Don't think for a moment that this implies that Malik radiallahu anh, was not qualified for fatwa. He said of himself that he did not give fatwa until 70 turbaned men, meaning 70 scholars, they licensed him to do so. And going further, he said, I did not sit to give fatwa until I asked Rabi'ah and Yahya ibn Sa'id, who commanded me to give fatwa. And if they had prohibited me, I would have refrained. This was the state of the scholars who knew that they were to be resurrected on a great day, on a mighty day, to stand before their Lord. The great grandson of Abu Bakr al-Qasim ibn, Mu uh, ibn Muhammad, or the grandson rather of Abu Bakr al-Qasim ibn Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, he was one of al-fuqaha al-sab'a, one of the Seven jurists of Medina. These seven fatwa was not given by anyone in Medina but them during their time. In a time when Medina was bustling with scholars. And in a gathering he was asked a question. And he answered, لا أحسنها. I'm not good at that. I, I'm not a specialist in that. I'm not qualified to answer that question. And the man said to him, but I know nobody more knowledgeable than you. And he said to him, and what can I do for you? I don't. No, I'm not good at this field, this field of law. And so an elder from Quraysh said to him, My nephew, maintain this word. Adhere to this word. For wallahi, I have never seen you sat in a gathering looking more noble than you look today. And Al-Qasim replied to him, And I, wallahi, will never, and I, wallahi, would rather my tongue be cut out than to speak about something that I do not know. This was the state of the scholars who, if they knew something, they would speak about it. And if they didn't, they would defer the question to someone else. So Noon, Abu Sa'id al-Qayrawani, one of the great scholars of the Malikiyah, was, one, uh, was once asked by a man a question, and days passed without him answering. So the man came to rush him for an answer. And, he, and Suhnun said to him, what can I do for you? What can I do? The matter is complicated and there are many opinions and it has trumped me. I can't find you, I can't find a solution, I can't find an answer yet. So the man said in praise of Suhnun, and you are qualified and you are fit for every, every difficult matter. And he said to him, hey hat, hey hat. <laughs> Impossible, impossible. You think I will sacrifice my flesh and blood to the fire for your praise? 
None were more God-fearing than them. None were more knowledgeable than them. And none were more trustworthy in their religion than them. Today, dear brothers and sisters, we live in an age where the number of platforms from which people can speak and propagate their views have increased in number and nature. And so, a whole host of self-endorsing individuals claiming knowledge and scholarship have found a range of options readily available for them to uh, promote themselves and their so-called religious opinions and make their voices heard. It's necessary to highlight the dangers of doing so. Not just for those who may potentially follow them, but also for these people speaking without knowledge. To highlight to them the hazardous path which they have chosen for themselves, which will lead to disgrace in this life before the Akhirah. Allah Ta'ala, He is the one who raises the scholars. As He said, Jalla Shatni, يَرْفَعِ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ دَرَجَاتِ Allah elevates by degree those who've, who have attained faith and those given knowledge. As for the ignorant, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَقْبِضُ الْعِلْمَ إِنْتِزَاعًا يَنْتَزِعُهُ مِنَ الْعِبَادِ وَلَكِنْ يَقْبِضُ الْعِلْمَ بِقَبْضِ الْعُلَمَاءِ حَتَّى إِذَا لَمْ يُبْقِ عَالِمًا اتَّخَذَ النَّاسُ رُؤُوسًا جُهَالًا فَسُئِلُوا فَأَفْتَوْ بِغَيْرِ عِلْمٍ فَضَلُّوا وَأَضَلُوا Allah does not take away the knowledge by stripping it from the hearts of men, but He takes knowledge by the death of the scholars. Until when no scholars remain, the people will take their leaders. They will take as their leaders ignorant people who when consulted will give their verdict without knowledge. So they will go astray and will lead the people astray. And so notice, in the verse, Allah states that He raises and elevates the scholars. And in the hadith, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam states that the ignorant are raised by the people. And therefore, do not be impressed by the number of views or followers that someone may have online. It is not indicative of their knowledge. When was the common person, when were common people made judges as to who scholars are? Not every student of knowledge is qualified to give fatwa. The companions themselves were not equal in knowledge. Among them was the faqih, the jurist, and the hafiz of the Qur'an, and the hafiz of hadith. And most didn't occupy a position of knowledge, by the way, but they enjoyed the privilege of suhbah, companionship which was sufficient for them. And so they had varying degrees of knowledge and understanding. For example, Allah Ta'ala, He says in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَكُلُوا وَاشْرَبُوا حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَكُمُ الْخَيْطُ الْأَبْيَضُ مِنَ الْخَيْطِ الْأَسْوَدِ مِنَ الْفَجْرِ Eat and drink until the white thread becomes evident to you from the black thread at dawn. And so one of the companions took this, literally, so he took a white thread and a black thread and placed them on his pillow and would continue to eat until he can distinguish the white thread from the black thread in the morning. The Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he corrected his understanding and he said to him, explaining to him that the white thread is the light of dawn. Yes, and that is the intent of the lawgiver. Not every righteous person, not every pious worshipper is a scholar, dear brothers and sisters. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told us to differentiate between the scholar and the abid, the alim and the abid, the scholar and the worshipper. For the scholar, his benefit far outweighs the benefit of the worshipper. And this story, I tell you, I am witness to, where a man said to me that he went to a local mosque, a mosque that was local to me before, and he went to ask a question on prayer and he said, I asked the first bearded man in the reception. And the answer, of course, indicated great ignorance in fiqh, great ignorance in, his, in law. And I said to him, what you did was akin to going to the hospital and asking the porter for medical advice. This matter, dear brothers and sisters, is widespread. We see it all the time and in almost every mosque. The person who frequents the mosque who looks the part will eventually be asked a question. 
So fear Allah and defer the question to those of knowledge and do not have a pop. Because in having a pop, you will be misguided and misguide others. For it is not a YouTube clip and khutbah that gives you knowledge or a little pamphlet that you read that will give you knowledge or even memorizing the entire Quran that is knowledge. No, brothers and sisters. Just to give you an idea as to what the conditions of the mufti are, that they must excel in at least one school of legal thought. That they must understand the differences between the schools of thought in order to accommodate. And that they must be sensitive to the condition of the mustafti, the questioner. Are they in the category of those who are given rukhas, licenses and special dispensations or not? He must, uh, 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 he must be able to give fatwa according to one school of thought and to stick to the one or to stick to the fields of law that he or she has specialized in. Ibn Mas'ud and Abdullah uh, 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 Ibn Abbas are both narrated to have said the one who answers every question that is asked is crazy. They considered that person to be crazy because they exposed themselves to so many dangers and errors. And of course the requirements of ijtihad are far greater and there is no time to list them all. The scholars of the past, my dear respected brothers and sisters, were obsessive in self-reflection and, in, and introspection. They always considered themselves subject to blame and accusation, accusation of ignorance and deficiency. They feared speaking. Umar radiallahu an, he said, he who speaks much will err much. And he who errs much will lose modesty and the one who loses modesty loses piety and the one who loses their piety their heart has died and it is when the scholars fled from ifta and speaking excessively it was then that Allah guided them to accuracy in speech and actions dear brothers and sisters fear Allah and speak only of what you know with certainty and know that his religion is not subject to your uninformed opinions and whims. May Allah Ta'ala guide us to what is best for us in this life and the next and preserve our tongues from violating against Allah Ta'ala's religion. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. الحمد لله على إحسانه والشكر له على توفيقه وامتنانه وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له تعظيما لشانه وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله الداعي إلى الحق وإلى رضوانه صلوات الله عليه وعلى آله Dear brothers and sisters We mention again Suhnun One of the great scholars of the Maliki Madhab Who once heard a preacher say the most unprofitable venture is to sell your akhirah, your afterlife for your dunya. And even more unprofitable is to sell your akhirah, your afterlife for someone else's dunya. So Suhnoon reflected over these words and he said, who would sell their akhirah for somebody else's dunya? And he reached the conclusion, it can only be the mufti. The mufti, who issues verdicts in divorce and in inheritance and ownership. A man will come and say, I have divorced my wife irrevocably. And then the mufti might say to him, this is of course the mufti who doesn't fear Allah. The mufti will say, there is no blame on you. And so the man will go and enjoy his family. The man and the wife will enjoy one another. And then the mufti has sold his akhirah for somebody else's dunya. Billah. Today, dear brothers and sisters, we hear self-styled muftis audaciously reject, rejecting agreed upon sharia values, which were never disputed in the past. And they are matters known in the religion by necessity. They go as far as permitting alcohol, gazing without limit, 
uh, non mahrams uh, 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 allowing men to wear gold, among many other deviant opinions. They wish to instill in the religion what is alien to it. And this is the practice of the munafiqeen, of the hypocrites. Allah Ta'ala, he said in Surah At-Tawbah, لَقَدْ بِتَغَوُوا الْفِتْنَةَ مِنْ قَبْلُ وَقَلَّبُوا لَكَ الْأُمُورِ They have most certainly sought to cause discord in the past and they have turned things upside down for you. The turning of things upside down, dear brothers and sisters, is to present the good as evil and the evil as good. The self-promoting so-called muftis of our age must be conscious of the dangers that they put themselves in and realize the harms of giving fatwa without knowledge and that these, uh, it's not a minor issue. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, من أفتي بفتي بغ... من أفتي بفتي بغير علم the one who is given fatwa without knowledge, the sin is on the one who gave him the fatwa. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Man aftanasa bi ghayri ilmin la'anatu malaikatu samai wa malaikatu al-ard. He who gives fatwa without knowledge to the people is cursed by the angels of the heavens and the angels of the earth. And Ali radiallahu anhu. He said, أَجْرَأُكُمْ عَلَى الْفُتْيَا أَجْرَأُكُمْ عَلَى النَّارِ The most brazen of you in giving fatwa is the most brazen in entering the fire. And if you're not sure, simply say, I don't know. This goes for everyone, regardless of your level of knowledge. If you don't know, say, I do not know. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, مَنْ حَدَّثَ عَنِّي حَدِيثًا وَهُوَ يَرَى أَنَّهُ كَذِبْ فَهُوَ أَحَدُ الْكَاذِبَيْنِ he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whoever narrates a hadith from me, which he knows is a lie, then he is one of the liars. And in a, another narration, and he thinks it could be a lie, then he is one of the liars. Unless you verify and ascertain the authenticity of the hadith, you cannot issue a legal ruling on it. That is considering you, that's providing you have the tools for deduction. You are not allowed to even share it. As we see hundreds of bogus hadiths circulating social media and on WhatsApp. The Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, if you do, if you say this word, then you get 10,000 this and a hadith that have no basis. And in circulating them and sharing them, you share the sin of the fabricator of the, of the hadith for propagating a lie. You're not lying against anyone. You are ascribing or you are attributing a lie to the master of mankind sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, Inna kathiban alayya laysa ka kathibin ala ahad. A lie or ascribing falsehood to me is not like ascribing a falsehood to anyone. Man kathaba alayya muta'ammidan faliyatabawwa maqa'adahu minan nar. Whoever tells a lie against me intentionally, then surely let him occupy his seat in the fire. Let him take his seat in the fire for ascribing to the religion what is not of it. Imam Malik's teacher, Rabi'ah, cried one day and he was asked, why, why are you crying, O Imam? And he said, a person with no knowledge was asked and consulted today. And indeed, a great corruption has appeared. He understood what it meant for an ignorant person to speak in the religion without knowledge. It is infiltration in the religion. And Rabi'ah also said one day, among the men are those who speak in matters of the religion without knowledge and they deserve imprisonment more than the thieves do. What about today then? What about today when those of no knowledge advance themselves for fatwa despite their evil reputation and their wretched in a state and their intention only being to show off and to crowd the scholars in their place? And they are warned, but they do not heed. And they are made aware, but they have no self-awareness. And they are forbidden, but they do not refrain. Such corruptors, Allah has promised that they will not succeed. He said, Jalla Jalalu, وَلَا تَقُولُوا لِمَا تَصِفُوا أَلْسِنَتُكُمُ الْكَذِبَ هَذَا حَلَالٌ وَهَذَا حَرَامٌ لِتَفْتَرُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ الْكَذِبِ إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَفْتَرُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ الْكَذِبَ لَا يُفْلِحُونَ and do not say lies concerning that which your tongues describe. 
this is lawful and this is unlawful in order to fabricate lies and attribute them to Allah. Indeed, those who fabricate lies and attribute them to Allah do not succeed. And Allah Ta'ala equated fatwa without knowledge to the gravest sin, to shirk. Where he said, Jalla Jalalu, Qul inna ma harrama rabbi al-fawahish ma zahara minha wa ma batana wal ithma wal baghi wal ithma wal baghi bi ghayri haqqin wa an tushriku billahi ma lam yunazzil bihi sultana wa an taqulu ala Allahi ma la ta'lamun. Say, indeed my Lord has only forbidden obscenities, both manifest and secret, and sin, and unjustified aggression, and that you associate with Allah that for which he has never bestowed any authority from on high, and that you say about Allah what you do not know. How then can an intelligent person, dear brothers and sisters, seek promotion and advancement in this field? Not least when they are not qualified, and even when they are qualified, to not hasten to it, but to observe some patience. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us, and to grant us knowledge, and to grant us wisdom, and the ability to refrain from speaking, when we know that in speaking there is no benefit. And that Allah ta'ala guide us to what is best, and that Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala increase our scholars, in virtue and increase the ummah in scholars. هذا وصلوا وسلموا على خير الأنام فإن الله أمركم بأمر بدأ به بنفسه وثنى بملائكة قدسه ثم بكم أيها المؤمنون فقال جل من قائل إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم وبارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد. The brother standing in the back, you standing is not gonna speed up this خطبة. You do not stand until the إقامة is given. اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم وبارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم عز الإسلام والمسلمين وأذل الشرك والمشركين وأعلي بفضلك كلمتي الحق والدين اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه عباد الله رحمكم الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغض يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون وأقم الصلاة Thank you.